It Couldn't Be Done by Edgar Albert Guest. Somebody said that it couldn't be done, but he, with a chuckle, replied that maybe it couldn't, but he would be one who wouldn't say so till he tried. So he buckled right in with a trace of a grin on his face. If he worried, he hid it. He started to sing as he tackled the thing that couldn't be done, and he did it. Somebody scoffed, oh, you'll never do that. At least no one ever has done it. But he took off his coat, and he took off his hat, and the first thing we knew, he'd begun it. With a lift of his chin and a bit of a grin, without any doubting or quit it, he started to sing as he tackled the thing that couldn't be done, and he did it. There are thousands to tell you it cannot be done. There are thousands to point out to you one by one the dangers that will assail you. But just buckle in with a bit of a grin. Just take off your coat and go to it. Just start in to sing as you tackle the thing that cannot be done. And you'll do it. When I was a little bit older than four years old, I lived in a place called Riverside Village with my mother and my older brother and my younger brother. And my mother was there by herself, and at night when she put us to bed, all three of us slept in the same room. Uh, she was tired of us. And so if you put, you know, you got into bed, you stayed there unless you were bleeding. And I remember this one night when, for some reason, my little brother Darren, who we called Kadidiki, got out of bed. Kadidiki left the room. And I was expecting any, any minute for my mother to start yelling, pick him up, bring him back in. She didn't, she didn't bring him back. And even at that point in my life, I had an active imagination. I assumed something got him. And I was worried, but not worried enough to go check. So I went and woke up my big brother. And I said, Kididiki is gone. You have to go get him. So my big brother crawled out of bed, and he left. And he didn't come back. And at that moment, my attitude switched from something might have gotten to them well, to, well, if they're awake, how come I can't be awake? So I decided I would get out of bed. And the door was open just to crack, and there was lots of light coming into the bedroom. And instead of peeking into the hallway, I just walked boldly out of the bedroom. And there was a giant in the hallway. And he'd already gotten my little brother. Darren, little Kadidiki, was holding on to one side. He was kind of holding on to this giant's shoulder, trying to kind of get away from him, staring into him. And, and my big brother was at the bottom. He was holding on to this thing's hand, or I guess the thing was holding on to him. And I just stared up. I'd never seen a human being that big before in my life. And he walked up to me. And before I could move, he scooped me up. And I went up and up and up and up and up and up. And I was staring at this giant person. And he kissed me on the cheek and said, hello, Dickel, because that was what they called me. It was my father. I'd never met him before. It was his first and last time coming back from Vietnam. And it's the first time I'd seen him. Through my life, there have been other giants. And all of us have encountered them. It's the first time you have a job interview. The first time you meet your intended's parents. The empty nest that's about to drop on my husband and I when our kids leave in the fall. And sometimes you have ones that are coming right at you, and they're terrifying. But every time you face a giant, it gives you strength to face the next one. And so right now, I would like you all to think about the giants that you have faced and know that they will help you defeat the ones that are coming right at you. So let's take a moment of silent meditation. Willa and her mother lived in the windy middle of nowhere. And her mother was not feeling well and stayed in bed for a while. But eventually she started feeling better and she sat up and she had a taste for corn cakes. And Willa was so happy to see her well, she said, I'll go and see if we have any cornmeal. And she took the blue bowl off the table and went out to the barn. And she opened the jar and sure enough at the bottom was just enough cornmeal to make some corn cakes. And she scooped it up and she put it in the blue bowl and she closed the jar. But as she was running back to the house, the, the north wind came whistling down, went into the bowl, scooped up the cornmeal and took off in cornmeal dust. Willow went inside the house. She put the bowl on the table and she said to her mother, do you know what just happened? 
Mother said, no, honey, what happened? The north wind just stole our cornmeal. And our mother said, oh, well, if it's gone, it's gone. There's nothing to be done about it. But Willow was a bright girl, and she knew there's always something to be done. She put on her cape, and she set off to find the north wind. She walked for most of the day until she came to a great stone house where the north wind lived. And there was a great stone knocker. And the walls were so high. And there were parapets at the top. And she knocked upon the door. Boom! 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 Deep within the house, she began to hear the north wind roaring. And it came out across the parapets and looked down at her from the front door and said, Who are you and what do you want? And she said, I am Willa, and I want the meal you stole from me today. It's not fair. You have so much and we so little, and you would take our meal. And the North Wind was quite surprised because most people did not come looking for the things he took. He said, well, I don't have your meal anymore, but I have something better. And he presented her with a cloth. And she took the cloth and she said, what do I want with a cloth like this? It isn't worth the thread it's woven from. And besides that, it's frayed. He said, ah, you'll want this cloth. When you lay it upon a table and say, spread cloth, spread, it will be covered with more food that will feed more than many. Being a bright girl, she thought she'd take the cloth. And she tucked it under her arm and she went down the road. Now we're going to leave Willa there for just a second. And I'm going to tell you that that giant, the wind that she faced, and the giant that I met in that hallway that night. They were part of the magic of my childhood. Willa and the Wind, that book is written by Janice Del Negro. Those stories, those folkloric stories, they were all part of my childhood. I loved them. I read them. And a lot of them I got from the giant in the hallway, my father. He would sit at the head of the dinner table and he would spin yarns. He did fractured fairy tales and Arthurian legend and, and, and Greek mythology. And he did it all in the first person. <laughs> we thought he was thousands of years old. And I never questioned that, because that was just part of my childhood. Of course, my father was thousands of years old. And in fact, so steeped was I in that magic that I remember one morning going around every single floorboard in my entire house, knocking on it, because I was certain that's how the tooth fairy was getting in. <laughs> and that if I got to the right spot and knocked on the right place, she would open the door. I would trick her into opening the door, and I could look right into fairyland. I was convinced of this. And this magic, all of this magic, was part of my childhood right up until the time I got to be about eight years old. I was sitting around with some friends and we were talking. Now, the thing about my father and the stories he told, you know, he told us he was apprentice to Merlin the magician. And he was a sleight of hand magician himself and he would make things disappear at the table, which just reinforced my belief. So I'm sitting talking to my friends, I'm eight years old, and I hear the words come out of my mouth, my father is thousands of years old. And as soon as I said that out loud, I realized something was wrong with that statement. <laughs> and I covered and I kind of laughed and said I misspoke. And I said, well, you know, he tells these stories. Uh, but I realized at that moment, it was impossible. He couldn't really be thousands of years old. Not really. Humans didn't live that long. And that was the first moment when the magic began to leave. Because when you start realizing that the magic of your childhood isn't real, it starts stripping away a lot of other things. And you start looking for the reality in things. And I, for one, really loved that magic. And I was sorry as it fell away. But that's what happens, right? You get older, it's gone. Or a lot of it goes. But that's okay, because you move into the next part of your life where you're in school and then you're trying to find a mate. And I don't know about you, but I ended up in several dead-end relationships. And I thought to myself, you know what? If I were looking for a house, I would make a list. I would list all the things I wanted, all the things that were option, and all the things I just didn't want at all. There were no starters. And if I were going to find a mate, surely I would keep him longer than some house. I should do the same thing. So I made a list. Things I wanted, things were optional, things I wouldn't stand. And at the top of the list of things I really wanted 
was I wanted someone who had a sense of fun, a sense of play. I wanted someone, and this is very specific, if I was sitting in a room building with Legos, I would want that person to stop, sit down, and build with me and never ask a question about it. <laughs> and any of you who know, my husband David know, I found that guy. <laughs> he is so much fun, and he understands how to play. And that's a kind of magic that as long as you have with you, you never get too old. But the best thing about that, getting married, is you get children out of this. You can, anyway. And then you get to be the ringleader of the magic. You get to start all over and you get to give someone else all the magic of your childhood. You get the stories and the songs and, and no one going, that didn't happen. You get it all. And so now, I, and I got two children too, Devin and Darren. And things started well. When my son was three years old, I was busy in the kitchen. I was at the table. I was chopping vegetables. I nicked my knuckle. I started bleeding. My son saw it and he said, and Devin set off to get mommy a Band-Aid and he ran out of the kitchen. <laughs> and I thought, that's what it's supposed to be. Because when you're three years old, you are the center of your own heroic journey. Even if it's going, just going to get a Band-Aid. My daughter at three years old comes dancing into the kitchen. I was so proud of that little thing. I said to her, you know what, Dareth? When you grow up, you can be anything you want to be. And she said, really? I said, yes. And she said, then I want to be a bunny. <laughs> she hopped out of the kitchen. And I said, yes, because when you're three years old, you can be anything. That's what's supposed to happen. I was very happy. The magic was going. And then four years old happened. Now, I don't know about you, but I kept the magic of my childhood a really long time. Apparently, eight years old is a little old. Four, I think, is a little young. My son gets into the back of the car. He's four years old. He buckles himself in, head down. He is dejected. Devin, honey, what's the matter? He said, Mom, I just don't think I'm going to be a velociraptor when I grow up. Now, you have to say, this is a kid who loved dinosaurs, loved them. In fact, when he was little, he would bend his body over, jut his chin out, put his hands like this, and lope instead of run. He was running like a two-legged dinosaur. He didn't move very fast, but he didn't care. He was running like a dinosaur. And I said to him, he's four, honey, wh why do you think that? He said, look at me. I don't have any scales. My teeth and my, my nails are so dull. I haven't got a tail. I don't think it's going to happen, Mom. <laughs> Four years old. And he started questioning the magic. The problem with questioning the magic is that as soon as you do that, you start questioning a lot of other things. Therein began a long series of really deep conversations I started having with that kid at the age of four that you're not supposed to have for a while. And I watched all that magic fall away from him really young. But that's okay, because I had another kid. <laughs> I could just keep magicking with her. Four years old. She says to us, I want to do a magic show. And I said, great. And she said, I'll call you all in when I'm ready. So she goes in her room and she shuts the door to get the magic show ready. And she doesn't come out. An hour passes. And I'm pretty sure she's forgotten all about it. And she's in there coloring or something. So I kind of knock on the door and I look at her and say, honey, are you, are you ready? What are you doing? She is sitting in the middle of the floor, dejected. Honey, what happened? She says, mom, I can't do any magic. I've been trying for an hour. None of it's working. And I had to sit down with her and explain that magic is an illusion, of magic tricks, you know, they aren't really pulling magic bunnies out of the hat. It's, it's a trick. And she, she said, yeah, I, I figured that out. I, I don't know if I've told any of you this, but as soon as my children leave the house, I'm going to write a book called Gifted and Cursed. <laughs> so four years old, they start questioning the magic. That was a hard thing to do to lose it that young. Fast forward, years and years and years and years. My son is in his last year of middle school youth group here at the community church. We're out raking the yard. He says, oh, mom, I got to tell you, last night, last night, one of my friends came out at youth group. I said, really? He said, yes. He said, it was amazing. He said, I, I am so proud 
that he had a place where he felt secure enough and safe enough. We were the first people he told. And he said, I, I was so honored. And he was glowing. And I saw the magic. That was magic. And I thought, that is amazing. And it's amazing. And it, it isn't the kind of magic where you pull bunnies out of a hat or turn into a velociraptor. It's the kind of magic that happens when people get together and say, we know something else is impossible, but here it is possible. And we did that. We made that. I was telling my daughter last night that I was going to talk about this in church. And she said, when did that happen? I said, I don't know, four or five years ago. She said, that happened to me too. I said, really? Yeah, a couple years ago. She was very blasé about it. I said, really? What happened? She goes, well, one of the girls came out and we were like, yay, congratulations. And we just went on. I mean, it happens. <laughs> How did that happen? I mean, we went from it's impossible. Oh my gosh. To, yeah, it just happens. But if you think about it, that's kind of how things work. It's impossible. It can't happen. It will never happen. And then it happens. We go, okay, well, it happened. And that, that's when I got in trouble because at this point in the sermon, uh, when I was working on your home, I suddenly looked up and I realized I had been speaking for an hour and 40 minutes. <laughs> because I suddenly started thinking about all of the impossible things. All of the things people said could never happen. That happened. And then we kind of went, oh, yeah, okay, well, whatever. We were never going to go to the moon. It happened. Okay, so we've been there. And now, do we think about the fact that there's a, like, flying, you know, space lab up? up? No, no. Do we think about the fact that there's satellites everywhere? No, we're just on our phones. That's amazing. People were never going to fly. People fly all the time, and we complain about it, don't we? So many things that could never happen. And I thought particularly about 1967, Lovings versus the state of Virginia. That was a big thing because in that year, in 1967, it was decided that no matter where you were in this country, even though it was impossible, people of two different ethnicities were allowed to get married. It became the law. What was the big deal about that? David and I were both born in 1967. <laughs> First year we... <laughs> The first year we could possibly have ever gotten married, we were born in the world. Was, ah. So many. <laughs> so many things are possible. It's impossible, right? And, and I think about our kids in a high school youth group. When I was in middle school, I was Catholic. Nobody would have come out at middle school youth group when I was a kid. <laughs> but we together have decided in this place, in this church, that things that other people said were impossible were possible. And as soon as you make that decision, you can do it. Integrating a church, impossible. Not really. And no one thinks about it now. But when it happened here, it was impossible. Two people getting married from different ethnicities, impossible. And now it happens all the time and nobody thinks twice about it. Gay people getting married. Alas, it, not as impossible as we think, is it? Nothing is impossible. And then you start asking yourself, well, if it wasn't impossible, how come we didn't do it already? Because somebody has to start it. Someone has to begin it. And somehow after it happens, you kind of think, well, how come we didn't do that before? Dr. Barber. You know, when things are impossible, when our legislator flipped, legislature flipped and we started going, what is happening? A lot of us were worried about it, a lot of us concerned about it, but he didn't just stay worried about it. He didn't stay concerned about it. He got up and started talking about it. That's all it takes sometimes. He was a voice in the wilderness, but he is not alone anymore, is he? All across our state and nationally, people are looking at what we are doing here because it's not impossible. When I was 23, I already knew I wanted to be a storyteller. I already knew. But I didn't quite know what was driving me. And then Joe Callahan was invited to speak at Northwestern University. Joe Callahan is a storyteller. He is a very tall man from New England. And I sat in that seat and the lights went down and that man started talking and the walls disappeared. And the ceiling disappeared. And he started telling the story called The Herring Shed about 
uh, these women up in Newfoundland who dried herring for the war effort in World War II. And as I sat there, he started dancing around the stage, thumb in the mouth, bend in the gill, kicking around the herring. <laughs> By the time he was done, I wasn't even breathing. I was just sitting there. And he left the stage and I thought, that, that is what I want to be. I want to be a magic person. I want to spend the rest of my life making the walls disappear. I want to spend the rest of my life making people travel to all over the world and see things that they've never seen and meet people who never existed or did exist and aren't here now. I want to do that. And I have spent my life chasing that dream that sometimes seems incredibly impossible of being a magic person. My son Devin is graduating from high school. He's going out to university. He's also a sculptor. And I must tell you, every now and again, he sculpts dinosaurs. <laughs> and I've seen some of the art he's done for some of the games he wants to build. And I assure you, if he actually starts building games, you will see dinosaurs. I told my daughter the story of the magician at four years old. And she just started laughing. And she said, just chill, Mom. I am magic. Just not in the way I thought. As for Willa, she kept going back to the North Wind because when she had that cloth, she went to an inn and an innkeeper saw what it did and he switched it out and gave her a, a counterfeit cloth. And she went home and she thought the North Wind had cheated her. And she went back, despite her mother saying there's nothing to be done. And he gave her a magic goat that dropped money in your hands, and the innkeeper saw that, and while she was asleep, he switched that out, and she took the counterfeit goat home, and she was furious, and her mother said, there's nothing to be done. She didn't believe that. She went back. And this time, he gave her a stick, and she says, what do I want with this stick? And he said, when you say lay on, stick, lay on, it will beat whoever you say to beat until you tell it to stop. She went right back to that inn. <laughs> and when the innkeeper tried to take the stick, she said, lay on, stick, lay on it, beat the innkeeper until he gave her back her right things and she went home. And that story ends by saying, and if you go through there and you stop at their house, she will give you a full, wonderful meal and enough money to get you where you need to be in comfort. Always chase the impossible. Because sometimes you catch it. This is a poem that came to me. Um, it didn't come to me. It, was something that I, when I say came to me, when as a child, I heard a lot. And I loved this poem, absolutely loved it. And I look back in my life and I realize that it says a lot about who I am, maybe. But it also makes me, it comes to me when I think about the things I have to do that seem really big, that seem impossible, that seem overwhelming. And I sometimes just repeat it to myself over and over again to help me get through those things. And I leave it with you, leave you with it this morning. The sun is full of shining light. It blazes far and wide. The moon reflects the sunlight back, but has no light inside. I think I'd rather be the sun that shines so bold and bright than be the moon who only glows with someone else's light. <laughs>